get always opportunity to be here and we're so glad that you're here with us today. So I just got word that the keynote speaker for today is already ready to take us through this section. As I said, I have a question personally. Prof, I'd like to know the way forward for the education sector. I'd like to know how we can integrate technology. I'd like to know what we can do to get better with this. You know, many countries are thinking far ahead. I'd like to know how Nigeria can incorporate these things. And I'm so sure that I'm going to sit back and learn a lot more. Let me just say a few things about Professor Ndubisi Ekeko before I hand over to him and just sit back with my bio and my paper and just begin to scribble down the words he's going to say. So first thing I'd like to say about him is that he is a professor, of course, Professor Nubisi comes with it, right? So he's a professor, he's an author, he's an entrepreneur, and he's also an academia. So he's also... Oh my God. Hello, Prof. Yes, can you hear me? And uh, actually, is can you hear? It's still very early here in the United States. Uh, can you hear me? Mm. Yes, I can hear you, Prof. Thank uh, you so much for joining us. Okay, so my apologies, I, I mean, if my dressing is not well, I didn't know I was gonna be on video, but I hope you don't mind. <laughs> no, we don't, we're just so glad to hear from you, Prof. Amazing things you're doing, we keep reading up the great things you're doing, and it's so inspiring. Thank you so much, thank you for having me. Mm. Thank you for being here, Prof. So Prof, I'll now hand over to you to take us through this session. But just before I do that, I'd like to tell you that Prof is the chairman of FAS Micro Group, is a thought leader who contributes regularly in Harvard Business Review. So we're deeply honored to have Professor Nubisi Ekekwe all the way from the United States join us for this discussion. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I will be having a conversation titled uh, Leading in a Tough uh, Economy. Of course, I've also drawn this slide with the leadership of Adverse Catalyst in case uh, it's shown right there on screen. We've just been looking at the constructs, model, processes, systems, the capabilities on how we can build leverageable values in building entities, especially in the educational sector, despite the fact that we have paralysis in our educational or an economic system. So to do that, I'll just give you a little bit overview of myself. I am the VC from a beautiful state of Abia State in the nation, Nigeria. I went to Federal University of Technology where I studied electrical electronics engineering. And then later on, I went to PhDs and four master's degrees and I've also worked with great entities around the world. And 2017, a patent I invented, a technology, the United States government acquired the rights to use it in so many applications in their endeavors. So that's me, and uh, I will go straight into this conversation. I will take you back to essentially the paralysis that we have in our economic system, uh, because uh, a topic today uh, looks at leading in a tough economy. How do we lead in a tough economy? And what are these uh, elements in this tough economy? We have seen this COVID-19 that brought a massive dislocation in the global economy, not just globally, also affected our local economies at different levels. We saw a huge lockdown, which affected the ordinance of market systems making it nearly impossible for us to actually continue our business, especially in the educational sector. We've also seen the changes that continue to unravel the nation, the hexmen, the bandits, the Boko Haram, insecurity just everywhere. And the Nigerian 2020 budget has been cut down because of challenges in funding it. That is a tough economy because our nation is still heavily dependent on the expenditure of the public sector. So when the budget goes down, there is a huge implication that many, many of our fellow citizens, and many of our public sector workers, and even the private sector, everything will be affected. And of course, if we are in the educational sector, our thought leaders, 
in this space, and we are going through a, a period of strike in the university system. It does mean that there is a huge part of educational system that is not working at the moment. So it's a very tough one that you could have secondary schools, you could have primary schools, even you know, the teachers are now on strike, but the universities are on strike. It means that that ecosystem of innovation that's supposed to flow across the tiers of the educational system, that we as a people in Nigeria, that we are not experiencing it. Of course, the biggest one is that our Nigerian currency naira has crashed, losing significant value compared to major currencies around the world. And this is typical. Whenever there is a little challenge in the price of crude oil internationally, our economy is uh, usually uh, affected as a result of being dependent on commodities and hydrocarbons. So when COVID came, we lost a significant capacity to any foreign exchange. And because of that, um, the Nigerian Naira paid a very significant uh, penalty for that. So we are working, we are living, we are practicing in a very tough economy. But how do we lead in it? So in this uh, conversation, I will take us through, from my own perspective, how we can lead in this uh, tough economy. But first and foremost, why do we really need to have companies? That's a question I would like us to ask. Why do we need to have schools? Why do we need to have companies? Because it's only when we have understood and answered that question, that is the time for leading even in a tough economy becomes very, very important. You know, we have companies because markets are imperfect. In any market, there is demand, the consumers and there is supply, the producers. The, the relationship between these two elements, the demand and supply, we define the purpose and the missions of markets because the man who owns something he wants to sell and the woman, she wants to buy something. And they have to come into a kind of market-based relationship for you to have a transaction. Now, unfortunately, most times you could have a scenario where somebody wants to buy something. Another person has that thing he wants to sell, but they cannot just come into an equilibrium point because of information asymmetry. And I give an example. I just come to Lagos now and I want to eat Amala. <laughs> And I'm looking for somebody who can sell me a mala. Let's assume there is no restaurant in Lagos. What do I have to do? I have to be knocking at every door in Lagos looking for people who can sell me a mala. <laughs> Interestingly, you agree with me that it's not a productive system. You agree with me it's not the most efficient way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So what happens? A lady wakes up one morning and says, hi, I am going to have a restaurant. So that if somebody like in Dubisi comes, to Lagos and he's hungry. He doesn't have to be knocking at the door, asking people, do you have Amala to eat? What, what will he do? He goes to a restaurant and then he buys Amala. So there is now a company that has existed and that company has come to fix the friction which has existed between me, the demand, the customer who wants to eat Amala and the, the, the supplier, the producer, the person that has made the Amala. And because of the essence of the existence of that company, they have brought us together, making it possible that there is now a better efficiency in the utilization of factors of production. And that brings the construct of market system, making it that I can eat this amala without having to knock at every door. And this is the same thing that happens across market ordinance. This is the same thing that happens across all elements of market system. You have some money, uh, you don't want to spend it, and you want to put it, you want to look for somebody that can give you a, a small interest rate. So you have a 10,000 Naira, and you say, hey, I'm not going to just spend this money. Let me keep it maybe for a year. But because I don't have anything to do with it. But if there is any man in, in Yobe State who can pay me maybe 10% on that 10,000 Naira, I will give it to him or her, provided that the person pays me the interest. And also, when I need that principal, the person returns it. And at the same time, there is somebody in Ibadan who needs that 10,000 Naira because he has a poultry shop, a poultry farm. 
But he can find you. You are there in your bed. And he is there in Ibadan. So what happens? A guy wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to start a bank. So that that person in Yobe can pull that 10,000 Nora and the person in the battle can go to the bank and ask for that 10,000 Nora. Maybe the bank pays that Yobe man 10, the 10% and now collects 70% from the man in the battle. The bank has fixed a friction which has existed between these two people, making it possible that they can come into an equilibrium point that they can now transact businesses because a business has fees of friction which has existed between them. Even in school system, why do we have schools? You have school because interestingly, students cannot just wake up one morning and begin to learn these things. There is a friction. The parents want them to learn. They want them to be literate. And now there is no mechanism, assuming there is no school, for them to do that learning at scale. So what happens? You wake up one morning and you say, let me start a school. So that if parents are looking for where to take their children, they don't have to be knocking at every door in Lagos, in Onitsha, in Aba, in Jos, in Yobe, in, in, in Sokoto. They now say, let's take that child to ABC primary school because that's where there is a, an institution that is facing the friction which is in between schools. So that is why we need companies. And because we need companies, something begins to happen. We need to have the capacity to deliver values to those entities that we want to serve. Because you have brought in that supplier, you who is providing that service, and now there is that consumer, the person that is consuming that particular product. And now you want to fix the friction, which is the need which is exactly what a particular person needs. You are now going through that process of leading. You are now going through that process of having the capacity to solve a specific friction which exists in the life of that individual. In the educational sector, we can say that the friction is that a child wants to be trained. The child wants to have the liberation of the mind, which is what education is supposed to do. You want to give that child, go take that child through a process so that the child will actually learn. And when that child actually learns, what happens here is that the child begins to develop. But let me just ask a question. Can you see my slide, please? Not yet, sir. Oh, you won't tell me. I have a slide. I'm so sorry. Oh, no yeah, I thought that. Uh, the organizers will actually project it. Sorry about that. Let me oh, just share the slide. Mm, sorry, right. sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Top, I must comment the ability to use a seemingly simple example to drive home and it's a very important point. I mean, you talked about how that simple things like solving a need, solving a need, for example, for food to get a mala eating in Lagos is about demand and supply. And then you talked yeah. about how that somebody from a different state in Nigeria wants to interact with another person from another state, and then someone comes in to find a solution to this problem. So I like how you've been able to start by showing us how simple it is. It begins really, from what I've seen, with solving a problem, with doing something that's creating a solution. And I like that yeah. problem-solving attitude that you bring to this discussion today. And you know, you started off by letting us know that, of course, you mentioned different challenges that we're already having. And I'm so happy that you're driving us to that point of finding the solutions. Because honestly, Prof, if you call 20 Nigerians into a room, there are so many challenges that we'll begin to list. But I'm so happy that we're going beyond listing the challenges to talk about the possible solutions to this. Prof, your slide isn't up yet. But yeah, um, I think I cannot share the slide because I'm on video. So it depends on the way you want it, but that's no, no problem. Um, the, because I actually was thinking that the audience can follow up if they see my slide, but I cannot be on video and I'll be on slide at the same time. So you decide the one you want. Share. We'll give you that permission to share now. You can do okay. that now. Please try to share again. Thank you. Okay. So you've, you've gotten the permission to share the slides now. OK. OK. 
Um, <clears throat> Now we can see your slides. Thank you. OK, uh, just a minute. OK, OK. So um, as I was explaining here that there are frictions, and those frictions, they come in different forms. And typically, what happens is that any company that wants to fix a friction has to now have capabilities to solve those frictions. Capabilities are essentially things that I have gotten the skill set. I have gotten the capacity to actually go and solve that problem, which I have seen in that marketplace. And the problem could be that giving children very good educational system are the problem. The capability can also be like I have mastered the elemental construct of mathematics, physics, and chemistry, so that in our schools, when skis come, they can actually learn things at a better level. So this is the mission. Now, if we have that mission going through that process of leading, a process of leading means that we are now developing capacities that will help us to actually solve problems that exist in the marketplace. Of course, the frictions are there. These are the challenges. Uh, and then we have to set up companies to go and attack those frictions because the capacity to attack those frictions are going to become very critical for, for us to have the opportunity of fixing the frictions that exist in the lives and in the market system. So we set up companies to do that and setting up the companies, they require that we have capacities, we have the capabilities. That means we can actually get those things that we have promised that we can get done down. For instance, if you have set up a bank, it means you have capacity to run a bank. If you have set up a school, it means you have the ability to actually uh, manage a school. It means you have the right teachers. It means you have everything that is necessary to actually run a school system. And when you have done those things, you release the forces. Because if frictions are forces, it means for you to overcome the frictions, which are challenges in the market, you need to create a higher level of force. And that higher level of force is actually what you exert in the marketplace. So this thing here, takes us back to one of the most fascinating postulations that happened many, many centuries ago. It was a time of immense conversation about the material component of the universe. You know, the Greek philosophers were having a conversation and asking this question, what is the world made up of? How did we all come here? What is the purpose of this universe? And most of them made so many different postulations. Tell say the world is made up of water. Hericly to say the world is made up of fire. But I like what a guy called Pythagoras said. He said that the world is made up of numbers. You know, he said that the world is made up of numbers. For tells everything on earth could be put into a modem form, you know, into a liquid form, because he said the world is made up of water. For Pythagoras, he said the world is made up of numbers. And it's on these numbers that I would like us to connect as we move into that mission, how do we fix the friction that exists in the marketplace? Because if the world is made up of numbers, it means that solving business problems, providing better educational system, and practically anything we do on earth, we can have better insights if we understand the numbers in that particular system. If we understand the numbers in the educational system, if we understand all those constructs, we can actually become more efficient in providing services in things that matter. So we know it is the world is made up of numbers. And if the world is made up of numbers, it means that we are going to collect a lot of data. We can have the capacity to make sense of the world if we have the numbers that surround the world. I take you back to that old model how do we all have better insight? How do we have better perspective of things? There are so many elements involved. And the human system has always have one thing in common. We're looking at how to compute, manipulate, process, and analyze numbers. And all the computational inventions from the time of Abacus to the time of Slidero to the time of ENIAC, to the time of invention of transistor, to the time of integrated circuit, to the time even what we use today at Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Office, and these things have looked at one thing. 
making it possible that we can process numbers. And it's only when we can process this number that is the time that we can begin to have an insight about the market systems where we are participating. Because it goes beyond doing something to doing something in an amazing way. And I take you back to the perception demand. If I have a school in Oshobo today, will I just be offering the minimum possible value? Or would I like to do something that will be transformational in the lives of our students? There are companies that exist to serve the needs of markets. The needs of markets are things that the customers know they already need. You just offer them those services because that's what they need. But there are companies that go beyond serving the needs of customers to the expectations of customers. And then there are companies that move beyond those expectations to serve the perceptions of customers. The needs of customers could be, I need electricity in, in any way, and you give me electricity from coal. But let's say I assume that I'm an environmental activist and you give me electricity from coal. You've met my needs, but you have not met my expectation. If a young man comes from AFSE energy systems and provides me electricity from renewable energy source like solar, I will possibly leave you and now join that company that gives me electricity from solar because they have met my needs and also met my expectation. The great companies are companies that go beyond the needs expectation to the perceptions of customers. When we want to lead in our sector, when we want to lead in our environment, when we want to lead in any category that we participate in a market system, we have to move beyond needs expectation to perceptions of customers. Perceptions of customers are taking customers into a new dimension that they can see a huge leverageable value in how you have fees, the frictions which exist in their lives. You know, the day iPhone came, the world embraced iPhone. But when iPhone was being built, many people did not understand what was happening. Call the time they said they took it to Verizon, a telecommunication company, Verizon passed over iPhone because it couldn't even make sense of the iPhone. It turns out that great companies most times do not necessarily go for focus groups. They do not necessarily go for surveillance in order to help to understand what customers need. They take customers to a dimension that they have never even imagined. And when those things happen, great moments happen. I give you a very short example because of time. In Nigeria, many years ago, when I was still in secondary school, a banking system ordinance came up. Diamond integrated banking system made it possible that if you travel from Lagos to Kanu in early 90s and you run out of cash, in the old Union Bank, in the old Afri Bank, in the old banking system in Nigeria, the old First Bank, if you are in Lagos and you go from Lagos to Abu to Kanu and you run out of cash, you have to leave Kanu, return back to Lagos to collect money, and then go back to Kanu. Even though there are branches of First Bank, Union Bank in front of you, the bank will say, yes, this is a new branch, another branch of First Bank or Union Bank. Unfortunately, you can only collect your money in the specific branch where you deposited that money. We can't just help you here, people. But now Diamond Bank came and brought the DIBS. And Diamond Bank said, you don't have to be in the same bank where you opened that account to operate it, provided it's a branch of Diamond Bank across the nation. That is a possibility. So that became a new domain in the banking system in Nigeria, making it possible that people can deposit money in one branch of a bank and operate it in any other branch of the same bank. That was perception demand. That was something not many customers thought was possible, but that product came into the market system and it changed the dimension of the market. So when you are talking about leading in a tough economy like Nigeria, I challenge you to think beyond me the needs, to think beyond meeting the expectation, to now think how are you going to work at the perceptions of your customer? The perceptions of your customers are giving them something they may not have even imagined. And in educational system, you can actually be taking those students to a new dimension of knowledge, knowledge accumulation, knowledge dissemination, and the knowledge application.
If you do that, moments will come. We've seen that also in different sectors. But let me just leave that and also tell it's all about accumulation of capability. You that want to lead, what are your capabilities in order to have the ability to face those frictions that exist in that specific sector where you want to do that business? Because if you do not have the capacity to fix those market frictions, if you do not have the capacity to actually do what you say you want to do, you will not be successful. And we have seen that across market ordinances, like when Dan Goten wanted to go into the making nodules. You know, one afternoon, Dan Goten announced that they were going into Dan Goten nodules. And then Dan Goten usually would like to use scale we like to use the knowledge base it has acquired across other industrial sectors to enter into a new sector where it can use its impact to create a good opportunity. And then one thing happened, the skill sets, the capabilities, the interesting, fascinating thing has changed. So the same model was that Indominus has the finest educational system for training managers. It has a very great way of actually how to train people. And when you do that, you can actually learn that you can defend your tough. I understand that this is an educational sector and um, if it's, uh, we understand educational sector. So in our case here is how, how are we going to build the, the next school of the 21st century. And building the next school system of the 21st century, that means that we can now have the capabilities of showing that how do we prepare these young people for software development? How do we prepare these young people for robotics? How do we prepare them for augmented reality and virtual reality? And how do we deliver educational system in a time that we have been dislocated from our primary physical space? If the kids cannot come to school, how do we reach them? How do we train them and how do we make them better? And it means that investing in the new educational tools, those things now become the capabilities that we actually need in order to improve the lives of the students and also give us the capacity for us to actually drive value in whatever that we want to do with them. So do, don't do those things will require some elemental constructs. How can we unlock value? Of course, you know that education is very critical for us to unlock a lot of value. And that value could be helping the, the school system, helping the economy have the best possible young people in the economy. Because if our talent is a firmware, the operating system will become that the schools are using those young people in order to empower an economic system that will affect our logistic economy affects our e-commerce economy, affects our agricultural economy, and affects our banking and everything. So how can education help us to do that? And that is where it becomes very critical because if you go back through human history, and if you go back through human history, I'll quote you here in the Bible, it says that when Moses appeared before the Israelites, that they marveled and thrilled because Moses had studied under the Pharaohs. At that time, the best educational system in the world was in Egypt. And Moses was fortunate that he has attended and studied under Pharaoh. So if he has studied under Pharaoh, his competitors saw that he's, this man has mastered and he was actually at a higher level. Now, if we expect the African economy or the Nigerian economy to move at where we are today, about less than $500 billion GDP to $3 trillion, which I believe should be the natural state of our economic system, our GDP, it means that the educational system now has to become the operating system that will empower that future, bringing this massive talent base we have in the nation to drive the apps and economies across all ordinances and market system. Unlocking that growth means that we can now lead that nation from the inside and out. Because our knowledge base, our human capital, those things remain the most comparative advantages that we have in the nation. And I will say this, that building that in the educational system, we mean thinking outside the box. Like the day Diamond Bank said, we are going to make it possible with depositing one branch you can withdraw it. How can we do that in the educational system? How can we deliver the best possible value 
for students? How can we engineer making it possible that parents can actually get that value at the most competitive cost model? And if we do those things, how can we as educators continuously improve on them, not benchmarking ourselves locally, but as well with chat market with the local audience? And that's what I say, going to the new basis of competition. The new basis of competition here is, if we have, let's say for instance, uh, uh, students then when they come in into our school and we can admit maybe 300 because that's the capacity. And let's assume that the digital economy has made it possible that practically we are now unbounded. Are there ways that we can use technologies like Edvest technologies or work with partners that can help us personalize education, not necessarily teaching students as a block or as cohort, but make it possible that each of these students can actually learn very, very well as though we are teaching them individually. You know, it's all about using technology, just like I mentioned about Pythagoras that say that the world is made up of numbers. How can you use the number for a child in order to improve the learning capacity of a child? How can you use the number from a school in order to improve how you actually educate students in that school? Because if you do not have the numbers for farms, if you do not have the numbers for nations, if you do not have the number for a child, there is no way you can improve those constructs. And that is where technology plays a very significant role. And technology is very, very important because without it, every other thing falls apart. So the key frictions that we see, there are so many of them, but we're just focusing here on education. And now unlocking that value means going back to this whole area of driving transformation. And then I'll talk about transformation here. It's all about taking a new dimension on how we can structure an educational system. You know, in the 1990s, we had this transformation in banking. In 20s, we had this voice telephony when MTN and Econet, all of them came. And now in 2010s, we're having the mobile internet data. You know, data just coming up, people now on their smartphone doing things. As we move into these 2020s, I have called it the era of application utility. And this era of application utility is going to affect practically every sector. Education is going to become one of the biggest beneficiaries of this moment. In other words, how can we use technologies? How can we use digital technologies to improve our ability, our capacity, not just to train a school's school, but also train a student personally, personifying, personalizing capacity to make it possible that these kids can actually be supported in areas where they are lacking will be very, very important. It means educating, not just that the fact that we are running a school that runs, students coming, they have to graduate, but actually running schools that can transform schools that can essentially transform little kids that when they came in, by the time they are going out, it's not that they have just gone through school. It's that we have transformed them and we have prepared them for the world that is ahead of them. It will not come if we do not use the data unique and specific to that child in order to help that child become a better student or a better learner. And it's a very important element that only one thing that can help us to do that at scale it's the deployment of digital technologies so that we can use that to improve whatever we are doing. And as we do that, I point you out that if the world we live is changing, if the world we live is being affected because of COVID-19, the implication is that even the way we educate, even the way we train young people cannot be in a state of stasis. It means that we have to understand that our world is changing and the way we educate is also going to change. You know, we are in a world now where most things in the world will be going to the digital space. You know, when we say digital means that, hey, we are not in a physical space having this conversation. All of us are somewhere, some are in Uganda, some in Lagos, some in Sokoto, some in Manaba, some in every part. I'm here speaking for United States of America. It means there is a new dimension of what is happening around the world. 
And you ask yourself, how is your educational system? How is your school? How are you prepared for this new redesign? Because the friction, which you originally was trying to fix, is shifting. And a lot of people say, we're moving into data migration. We're moving into a time when even our schools have to move into data. And I think that's what some of these educational technology companies like Edbex, is one of the things they're trying to provide to schools and communities, making it possible that you can build on technology systems that even if you do not have those technology systems, you can work with them as partners to see how you can improve your ability, your efficiency, your capacity to use technologies to accelerate to, to, to serve those students better. So we are going to see those dimensions. And we're also seeing what is happening. They say education from anywhere. We don't know when the schools will open. And even if the schools open, we don't really know how the relationship will be. But can I tell you that after this COVID-19, the world ordinance will have to adjust to new realities. And even educational system has been affected in that way. How can we bring, using this technology that we have seen that it actually works, how do we now bring it into, into that? But the point is this, if the world before coronavirus was different and the world after it is certainly different, how are we going to regurgitate the way we educate, the way we train in order to compensate, accommodate the new realities of our time? You know, understanding that the world has shifted will also mean that our business models in the educational system has to adjust. But the, the fact is, as you move into the digital space, it's also important to know that you are no more competing within your local community, you're also competing globally and internationally. But it's point this, you make these students that come in, they graduate out of those schools and they become better prepared for the opportunities ahead of them. And it's only when you can do that, that you can, change the ordinance of things about our economic system. You know, in our local economy, we don't know how uh, uh, so many things will happen. Some said we're hoping that the recovery moves very fast, but there is just no way that you will not be affected because if our recovery is dreaded, I mean, unfortunately, if you bought stock in 2007 in Nigeria, you've not recovered from the value where it was. So. In a way, Nigeria has not even recovered from the market collapse of 2008 and 2009. Now we have this new one. And if that is the case, the implication here is that there is still a high level of paralysis, especially at the economic level, that will still. So how are you going to run schools? How are you going to command value? How are you also going to deal with the challenges of Forex? How are you going to even the insecurity system where you have to have guard Security men everywhere because you want to protect the kids. But that is where the opportunities of also looking at digital technologies can help you. It's not about just deploying technologies, but it's about deploying technologies intelligently so that at the end of all, you can, can and deliver great value. But I will say this as I'm rounding up here, that the promise of the future is unbounded. The opportunities that we have in our beautiful nation, Nigeria, we can see they are there because they have not been solved. And because they have not been solved, it means that someone has to solve them. And if someone has to solve them, it means that one of us can do that. You know, if I go to my village in Abia State, Ovim, I was there in the Green Christmas, I went to the same secondary school I studied. And I saw what the community leaked, what they have done. Uh, they brought in a computer, a very big computer lab. In short, the, universe, the state university even goes there to do lab. You know, I saw that people in the, in the town, they even want to send their kids to the village because they saw that the facilities in the village school was even better than the ones available in, in the city. So the point is, if you build great value, I'm, I'm very confident that even in a time of a tough economy, markets, in this case, the students and their parents, they are certainly going to, to come to, to, to patronize with you. So I'll be rounding up. I will challenge us that we have a wonderful economic system 
and, 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 and we have a huge market base in Nigeria. Leading in a tough economy will require building a solid resilience and building capabilities so that we can deliver the best possible value. And one of the ways of doing that is improving our ability to execute. And execution comes by improving productivity. And most time, technology is one of the things that will help you to improve productivity. Because productivity here is doing things at a ridiculously faster pace, even at reducing reduction of cost. So if we have a mindset that we can take that lesson from Pythagoras, where he said that the world is made up of numbers, apply that construct, personalize how we educate young people, give insights, generate data about how those kids are performing, and individually, person, we personalize things that we can help them to improve. By use of technologies, I am confident that many more young people can, can rise, and many of them can become extremely great citizens of our beautiful, our beautiful nation. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think my time is up. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Ndubisi. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Prof, I must say that you've set a tone for a rich discourse and you also have inspired us because a lot of things you were saying was just showing us how practical it is we can have this digital, you know when we say digital integration or technological integration, sometimes it sounds big, but you've just shown us that this comes with an attitude of problem solving and we can do this, it's about spotting them and taking these measures. So thank you so much for inspiring us and also educating us. Thank you so much, Professor Ndubisi. That was Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe starting on, starting up this conversation and setting the tone with that keynote speech. We're now moving on to take interviews. Prof, thank you so much once again. We're so grateful to have you. Thank you so much for coming, Prof. Okay. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies. Bye-bye. All right.